I sure am glad that my internet browsing is anonymous and no one can track me down. Wait, it's not and they can? Oh no! My personal data is at risk! Hackers are gonna steal my credit card information and use it to buy... I, I don't know, stuff I don't want. How can I protect myself while I'm browsing online? I know, I'll just use Atlas Bupin. Wait, it's... it's pronounced VPN? But... Wait, what does VPN even stand for? Atlas VPN is the best way to make your internet browsing safe and secure for almost no cost. It allows you to browse using an IP address from somewhere else, so the internet thinks you're in a different location. This allows you to keep your Google searches and other activities completely private. Disclaimer, Atlas VPN will not stop the government from tracking you down if you commit felonies. Please follow the law at all times. It prevents companies from selling your data and helps keep malware and obnoxious advertisements at bay. Talk about two birds! Right now they're having a summer deal where you can get three years of Atlas VPN Premium for just $1.83 a month. That's less than an order of McDonald's hash browns for a whole month of protected browsing. You know what else you can do with a VPN? Watch region-locked content on streaming services. Netflix is awesome everywhere except the US. So if I want to watch Dungeons & Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, without paying for Paramount+, Plus, all I have to do is say I'm in Japan or one of the other not-America countries, and voila, I'm in. No need to buy 30 different streaming services just to watch the thing everyone is going to rave about for two weeks and then erase from their memories. Want to save even more money? Use Atlas VPN to get great deals on products that are cheaper in other places. Everything from Spotify to airline fees and hotel rooms can be cheaper. All you have to do is sign up. The summer deal ends soon, so if you want to get three years of the greatest VPN this side of Valhalla for only $1.83 a month, click the link in the pinned comment below to get started. So, you may have looked at the title of this video and thought that I was exaggerating, but I can assure you, I am not. Uh, the Lorax, if you're unfamiliar, is an animated movie that is a loose adaptation of a Dr. Seuss book by the same name, and it is about a world where all the trees got cut down, and so there's no more air and people have to pay for it. And, well, Breathe, it took me too long to grab that, Breathe by Sarah Croissant is a dark and more serious version of that exact same setup. For what it's worth, this book came out seven months after the Lorax film did. Maybe it was inspired by it, maybe it was developed independently, I'm not totally sure, but I'm going to refer to it as an edgy Lorax ripoff because I think that's really funny. And the setup for this story is that after an apocalypse, which is only ever called The Switch, uh, Switch is capitalized by the way, we're not messing around. Uh, the trees are just all gone, and now what's left of humanity all lives under a bunch of giant domes with very little air. And that air is not free. Like, you have to pay for it. Some people are premiums, which are upper class, you know, rich people, they rule the pods. Uh, then there are auxiliaries, who are lower class. And, again, they, they have to pay for all their air. Like, so much that most people barely even exercise. So, they can't dance, they can barely kiss, they just, they can't do most things that we take for granted nowadays. It's like the American healthcare system, only far simpler and less predatory. A couple of years ago, the YouTuber Sarah Zed did a video on the rise and fall of weird young adult dystopias, and even she just mentioned this briefly as an example of that trend, and she literally said, yeah, this is just the Lorax movie. And, a lot of other people said that, and a lot of other people poked fun at it for that. And I think I was less dismissive than most people were. Because, sure, the idea of all the air going away and people having to pay for it, that's unrealistic, yeah. But it is making an actual point about society, which a lot of terrible YA dystopias did not do. Like, in the real world, we have to pay for shelter, food, water, medicine, like, things that we need to live. They aren't luxuries. These are things we need to live and we have to pay for them. And this is just adding one more resource to that list. Like, if you feel uneasy or gr disgusted by having to pay for air, maybe you should also feel the same way about having to pay for those other things. You know? Like, it, it's, it's an actual point. You know, it has an actual point, which does put it above uh, other entries in this genre. And that said, it's still pretty bad. Like, I have both books here, you can see. This is the whole series, it's only two books. And it, it's bad, but I've, I've read so much worse. It's nice to read a book series that's bad just because it's silly and stupid. 
you know, it, it doesn't actually cause me pain. It's not bad because it's just ungodly long and stretched out the way Throne of Glass is. It's not horrifically boring like Leviathan was. It doesn't have an obnoxious Mary Sue protagonist like House of Night and Leviathan and Throne of Glass, if I'm being honest. And it doesn't push abhorrent beliefs that I just hate and disagree with like the way of the Shadow Wolves. And it's also not like Pariah where it's just gross. Like, if, if you haven't seen my video on Pariah, check that out. That book is just gross. Breathe and its sequel, Resist, are bad, but they're just, like, regular level of bad. But before I get into the story, I want to tell you, hey, uh, go to the pinned comment so you can sign up for one of these plushies. Look at limited time only. We have a campaign going to make sure that they, you know, actually come out. Let's, let's do it. Come on, check out. Check out the campaign. Get a plushie. Do it now. Do it now. The rest of the video is not happening until you go down to the pinned comment. Go. Do it. Hurry up. So Breathe follows three POV characters. Later they add in a fourth one, but the first book it's just three. Uh, their names are B, Quinn, and Alina. And then the second book brings in another guy named Ronan. They all live in something which is just called The Pod. Or, okay, I call it The Pod. Sometimes the characters refer to it as just The Pod. Its official name is Breathe. I'm not calling it that because that's weird. Breathe is a verb. It's not a noun. Stop calling things verbs. It's confusing. And like I said, the pod is a giant dome which is just sealed off from the outside and people there all breathe in artificial oxygen. And Alina is a rebel which is fighting against the ministry and the ministry is the ruling government of the pod. Quinn is a premium and the premiums are, you know, rich people. So he's a rich kid. His dad is a general in the army and he, in fact, I believe he runs the entire armed forces of the pod, except he doesn't actually know his dad is a general at first, we'll get to that later. And B is Quinn's friend, but she is a poor auxiliary, and also she's in love with him. And they all wind up, after a series of events, it's not a series of events, but we'll get to it, but they all wind up outside the pod together, and they go on a journey to sort of save the world. It's, it's not good. It's not good, but we'll get into the specifics later. That's what you're here for. I don't know how long this video is at right now, but it's probably pretty long. So let me get some positives out of the way before we really start tearing into this. Um, I do like that it's only two books long. You know, like, this story is a bit stretched out, but it could have been stretched out way, way more. And since trilogies were really king at the time that this series came out, I, I don't know exactly why it was only two books, but I am grateful that it's only two books. Uh, it is written somewhat competently, like the prose is mostly okay. There are still plenty of weird or bad lines in there, but it is, it's not that bad. I've read much worse. Uh, there are, overall the world is not good, it's poorly thought out and stupid, but there are parts of it which do feel very real and very lived in. You know, I did get a sense that a lot of the things in this world, especially in the pod, are really old and starting to fall apart. I also thought that the covers were kind of neat. You know, the first one you have like the giant dome and you can see the wasteland outside it and there's some characters just standing there. Uh, but then in the second one you can still see the dome but now it's full of greenery and the wasteland is also starting to have plants grow and it's like, it's healing almost. You know, you're seeing progression and I just, I don't know, I, I kind of liked that. I, I like when covers in a series are actually connected with one another instead of, here's this cool thing, here's this cool thing, you know? Like, th this one actually shows some progression, I like that. And I will say that the ending of this series hit a lot harder than I thought it would. You know, it it's not amazing, but I did actually feel some things at the end of this. So that's, that's, you know, may maybe I'm damning it with faint praise there, but I, I did kind of like the ending. There are so many problems we can get into though. Like, the science, for starters, is absolute nonsense. From start to finish, just absolute nonsense. Like, the idea of oxygen disappearing is just ridiculous. And I'll go into more detail about all the specifics of that later, but like, just the very setup for the story is ridiculous, it's nonsense, it's, it's not a thing. Okay, that, that's not going to happen, this is not plausible. Uh, none of the POV characters have distinct narration, so I kept getting them confused. You know, I've, I've said this a hundred times, I'll probably say it a hundred more. If you're going to have multiple first-person 
POV perspectives in uh, your in your book. You probably shouldn't, but if you're going to, you have to go to great lengths to make them all sound different and distinct from one another. Uh, the Young World is one of the only examples of this being done well, because every character has a very, very distinct voice, uh, and moreover, it's typed in a different font for every character. So just looking at the words, even not actually reading them, you can instantly tell who's a POV this chapter is supposed to be from. The rebellion against the evil government... Oh, spoiler alert, there's a rebellion against the evil government here. I bet you didn't see that coming. But the rebellion just wound up being way, way too easy here. Like, the, the characters and everyone else just had... I don't, I don't know, they didn't have a difficult time doing it, and they really should have had a difficult time doing it. And most of the characters have little to no personality. Like, e even the main characters, there's not much to say about them. There, there's a little bit I can say about them, but there's not that much to it. And the side characters have even less. Like, altogether, the, like, eight or nine characters in this book that have something about them that defines them at least a little bit, Altogether, they make, like, one personality. It's it's not good. And later on in the story, these weird sexual assault subplots come in. It's... Uh, I, I didn't like it. I didn't care for it. I've seen it, that handled worse elsewhere, but I didn't care for it. Just, I don't know. Overall, this series doesn't have, like, one or two big, glaring things that stand out and make me mad or upset the way a lot of really bad book series do. This is just a series of weird and dumb decisions, and it just left the entire book series feeling empty and dead with a couple of people running around insisting that nothing is wrong. Like, I don't know, it's like the literary version of Pueblo, Colorado. I hope all five people in my audience who actually understood that joke found it funny, because I'm not cutting it out. These books are not nearly as bad as they could have been. Like, they, they could have been so much worse. So. They were pretty easy to put up with, you know, I was able to get through them without giving myself a headache, I didn't have to force myself to get through it a lot. But a lot of really bad books are bad because they make, like, really, really bold, ridiculous, bad, dumb decisions, and this doesn't do anything bold. You know, it does, like, weird and dumb stuff, but it doesn't really do anything crazy, it's not taking any risks, so there's just not that much to laugh at either. and. Ah, I don't know. Let's get started. Spoilers ahead. Leave if you don't want spoilers. So, we start off with Breathe, and the first page says that oxygen used to be the most abundant chemical element on Earth before the switch. So right off the bat, we're just, we're just wrong. Like, the atmosphere, currently, in the real world, is about 21% oxygen, and it's over 70% nitrogen. So just like right off the bat, it's like, no, oxygen is not the most abundant thing on Earth. We're off to a great start here. This rivals R.M. Huffman and his insistence that dragons are real. So we start with part one, the pod. And the first chapter is from the perspective of Alina, remember, the rebel who's fighting against the government. Breathing is a right, not a privilege, so I'm stealing it back. I'm nervous, but I'm not scared. This is the mission I've been training for. I'm ready to lead. Okay, that's almost a good opening. Like, it, it goes on a bit too long, but it, it almost works. Like, if you just cut off everything after I'm taking it back, like just the first line, breathing is a privilege, not a right, and I'm taking it back, then I think it would have worked. Because it, it just going on for a couple of sentences about how Alina is an awesome, cool rebel, it just makes it feel like it's trying a bit too hard, to be honest. So Alina is going on this deadly mission with another rebel whose name is Abel. And they are in the biosphere, which is the part of the pod full of plants, and it it creates air. Like, they're there to steal uh, clippings from the trees so that they can, like, plant trees elsewhere and make their own air, which makes sense, that's fine. But later we hear that all of the air in the pod is made by machines, and here we have them saying that, oh, okay, most of the air is produced by these trees here, like, not... None of this adds up. So the two of them infiltrate the biosphere by just pretending to be part of a tour group, which, okay, that makes sense. And they have very little time left to do their mission because the... And a voice comes over the intercom and it says the biosphere is closing in five minutes. I don't know why a tour would be going on if they're closing that soon, but whatever. Why can't your aunt and uncle do this? 
I already explained it once, I snap. They're in agriculture, and they don't get permits for this part of the biosphere. It's a little strange that they don't have access to the entire biosphere, but okay, whatever, it's a security protocol, we'll, we'll just roll with it. And overall, Abel is nervous, but they do go through with the mission. Like, he throws a rock as a distraction, he accidentally hits a tourist in the head, and the tourist cries out verbatim, I've been hit! I've been shot! Which is not how people act when they've just been hit in the head with a rock, but okay. And Abel is mostly worried about not getting caught. Like, he's thinking, oh shit, that, that person, they, we might get caught if that person keeps going, in, instead of worrying about almost killing someone, because, like, he wasn't aiming for them, he was just trying to make noise and distract people. But whatever, they do make a distraction. Alina runs into a restricted section, and she mentions that most auxiliaries can't run like her because they can't afford to pay for ex extra oxygen, but her and Abel have spent a lot of time in alleyways out in the pod training and trying to get in shape, which does not make sense. Like, I believe that the alleyways would be out of sights of, like, security cameras and, like, police patrols and stuff like that. So that, that part makes sense, but I don't believe that no one would notice extra oxygen being used. Like, it's mentioned specifically that the government monitors how much oxygen is used in houses so they can tell if people are exercising or otherwise doing something they shouldn't be. And so they would probably measure how much is being used in the streets, too. Remember, this is all under a big dome. And later it's mentioned that people walk around the streets with oxygen masks, like even in Zone 1, which is like the rich area, which implies that air in the streets is really thin. So air in the alleyways should also be thin. None of this makes sense. So Alina does manage to steal the clippings. She doesn't get caught. She thinks about how she's in love with Abel for a bit, and then the first chapter ends. And honestly, that is an okay intro to the story. Like. If Alina was the protagonist, we could go on to the aftermath of the mission and then get into the main story from there, maybe explain more about her life and what it's like to live in the pod, but she's not the protagonist, so even if you get invested in what's happening at the beginning, you essentially have to restart the story, and now we go to chapter 2 where we're learning about B. And this is a problem that comes back up again a lot in this series. Like, We'll have one character's storyline, which starts getting kind of good and kind of interesting, but then it switches over to another character doing something completely different, and it just takes you out of it and completely ruins the pacing. It's like if you were watching The Thing, and then in the middle of the blood testing scene, it just suddenly cut to the baseball scene from Twilight. Like, even if you enjoy the baseball scene from Twilight, it just ruins both to have them intercut together like that. So B is... A student who is in class, and she's also with Quinn, who, remember, is the third POV character. And they're all in the middle of class having a debate with other students, and it's like a test, you know? Profess their professor and some others are just observing them. And if B does well on this test, she might get accepted into the leadership program, which could allow her to become a member of the ministry. And remember, she is very poor, so being able to make it up in the world is a pretty big deal for her. And the debate is about whether or not trees are essential. Several students say no. And then B says, actually, yes, trees are essential because we need to breathe air. Like, it's just, it's just a way to try and make B look smart by comparing her to other people who are really, really dumb. So we find out that Quinn, as a premium, has a tattoo on his earlobe. Like, premiums are all identified by having a tattoo on their earlobe, which is an odd choice? Because that seems like it would be easy to either not see it, or it'd be really easy to fake it. And later, it is confirmed that, yeah, it's really easy to fake a premium tattoo. So you'd think it would either be, like, something much more visual and much more easy to see, like a tattoo on the back of their hands or their forehead or something to make it clear who they are, or not visual and just have it be, like, a chip under their skin or something, and they want to test if you're a premium, just scan it. Like, you'd... You'd think, but I guess not. Uh, anyways, so they argue with the rich kid kids for a bit. The rich kids think the pod is paradise because, uh, I don't know, reasons. And then it ends. And Quinn invites B on a two-day camping trip. And you're thinking, wait, this is the apocalypse and they camp? Yeah, like they just... Kids just go outside the pod and like 
pitch tents and go camping sometimes. That's just a thing that happens. First of all, they have to take oxygen tanks when they go out there because, again, there's not enough air for them to breathe. And there's also, like, nothing out there to see. Like, there's no plants, obviously. There's no impressive sights that we hear about that they want to see. There's, like, no animals to go hunting if you're into hunting. Like, there's, there's nothing out there. And so if there's anything that goes wrong, they die. Because, again, there's no oxygen. <laughs> and they need oxygen to live. We're humans, we need to breathe. And later, after this, we also learn that there are drifters out there, like, which are people that were exiled from the pod for cr one crime or another, and that drifters can be super violent. So like, why would you go camping out there? Why, why would people allow their kids to go camping out there? It's not like Quinn is saying, oh, we're gonna have to sneak out. Like, no, he just wants, to go out and no one will stop him. That's like sending your kids to a sleepover at Michael Jackson's house. Like, do they do this for bragging rights? Like, to say, hey man, I went on a camping trip, got into a fight with drifters, and I survived. It's awesome. And if that's the case, then Quinn is acting very casually about it. Like, he's just inviting his friend along, saying like, yeah, it's a simple camping trip. And at the same time, people probably shouldn't allow teenagers to just go out like that. <laughs> If that's the reason they're going out, is to get into fights with homeless drifters. Like, I don't know, man. I know I'm focusing on this a lot, but this is the inciting incident for the entire story, is them going out to go camping, or they're planning to go, camp to go camping, it doesn't work out that way. This is the inciting incident for the entire story, and it makes less sense than the lore for Elden Ring. Like, the only way I could see this working is if it was some sort of rite of passage that kids had to go through in order to be considered adults, you know? Like, they get thrown out for a week, and if they survive the week, then they become adults. Like, at least then, it would make sense why they're being put into this danger, you know? It, it just doesn't make sense as it is here. So anyways, uh, B is not accepted into the pod leadership program, and she's sad about that, but it never really comes back up in the story, so it doesn't mean that much. Uh, she is also in love with Quinn, but he doesn't notice because, again, her narration and Alina's narration are exactly the same. So let's make them sound even more similar by both pining after a guy who doesn't know they're in love with him. She goes home, tells her parents that she failed to get into the program. Uh, they're all poor and stuff. It's kind of sad, I guess. I don't know. They, they're poor, but it doesn't seem that awful. Honestly, their living situation, I mean, it doesn't seem that awful. Uh, it is also confirmed that the government monitors oxygen use in their apartments. And apparently their taxes pay for a certain amount of oxygen, but if they use more than that, then they have to pay for that. Like, they have to, anything past that is charged. And I'm wondering, like, does a private company run this? That There's no indication that a private company runs this? I, I don't know. And it's also mentioned by, uh, uh, by, excuse me, I was about to say Alina, by B's mom, again, they blend together so much, uh, it's mentioned by B's mom that they tie toddlers to their cribs so that they don't move around and use too much oxygen. I feel like if you tied a toddler to his crib when he's going to sleep, he would just cry a bunch and use up even more oxygen. Also, what the fuck? They just tie toddlers to their cribs. That's not okay. And uh, her parents tell her, hey, B, honey, baby, darling, you need to marry Quinn, not because you love him, but because he has money, and he'll provide you with a good life. And she feels weird that her parents are telling her to marry Quinn, but she also, she is in love with Quinn, so it's fine, I guess. And you might think that this is, like, the beginning of a character arc, or the beginning of some sort of subplot. And it's not. This, this goes nowhere. It, it could have been kind of interesting. You know, it could have been kind of neat, like... Maybe B could be wondering if she's like really in love with him or not, or if she's just uh, fascinated by the idea of the life that she could have by marrying him, you know? Like, that could have been neat to see her try and figure out how exactly she really feels, but we, we get nothing like that. And finally, after that, we get our first Quinn chapter, and he's the worst POV character by a pretty big margin. Like, I, I'll say right now, by the end of the series, I did like B a little bit. Uh, she's, for now, she's just bland, but over time she did start to grow on me. 
Alina is just there. I, I don't have much to say about her either way. Quinn is the worst. Like, he is just oblivious. His inner thoughts are annoying. He barely does anything worth praising throughout the whole series. He's just a dumb, spoiled rich kid at the beginning. And then by the end, he's still a dumb, spoiled rich kid. He never becomes anything more than that. So Quinn is in line to get a vaccination with some other people. Apparently, they actually get vaccinated a lot, like once a month for various diseases. And that, that actually does make sense because, you know, everyone's living in really close proximity. The air is recycled and shared a lot. Like, disease would spread easy in that environment. So I can understand why they would want to make sure people are caught up on their shots. I don't know about all these vaccines. Sometimes I think it would be better to get one of these colorful diseases. I ramble on, hoping I can keep her engaged. Fuck off, dipshit. Now, let's be clear. The vaccines here aren't harmful, uh, but they also aren't vaccines. We find out later that they are designed to lower your red blood cell count, which makes people need higher oxygen levels to, to live. That way they don't go outside, they can't live outside. Uh, because outside the pods, there is some oxygen. It's very low levels of oxygen. They say it's about 6% of the atmosphere, since all the plants died? Like, they, they say all the plants died, but then they also act as if most of the plants died because they mention that the atmosphere is slowly healing, but it'll be, at least they think it'll be like many generations in the future before they can go outside. I don't know exactly. And we find out much later, spoiler alert, that you can actually train your body to live with less oxygen. So if you just live with progressively lower oxygen levels for a while, eventually you'll just get used to it, and then you can just walk outside without a mask. Like, yeah, you can, you can just leave the pod. No mask, no suit, no nothing. You can just walk around and act totally normal, which is not at all how that works. Like, low oxygen levels in your blood leads to hypoxema, which is not a good thing to have because symptoms include brain fog, headache, rapid heart rate, weakness, fainting, and death. And if you lived somehow, but you had really low oxygen levels for a long time, it would start to damage your organs, including your heart and your brain. So you would still die eventually. Now, you can get used to thinner atmosphere at higher elevations. In fact, I think that's uh, what the author of this book heard about and just misunderstood it a lot. Like, uh, if you go climbing on mountains or something, then as the air gets thinner, as you get higher up the mountains, uh, you get tired more easily, your heart rate increases, you have to breathe more, you get winded easily, uh, winded more easily. Uh, but after a while, your body does create more red blood cells and then you just, you get used to it. You know, like, I live at a very high elevation and I've lived here most of my life, so it's pretty normal to me. But then once I go to lower elevation at sea level or something, suddenly I need less oxygen and I can just, like, I can run forever and I can run way faster than I normally can. Like, it, it's really interesting. If you've never done that before, you should try it. However, your body adjusting like that does take time. And before that, you'll probably live, unless you have other medical conditions or you go, like, way, way too high in the mountains where there's just not enough oxygen for you. Uh, but the air is just thinner. Like, the atmosphere is still about 21% oxygen, there's just less atmosphere altogether. And here's the thing. In this world, all the trees and other plants died. Like, I think they burned up, but it's not specifically said. Meaning that, and if there's... So they went from 21% oxygen to 6%. That 15% drop, that didn't just vanish in... I was about to say vanish into thin air. Uh, that oxygen didn't vanish into non-existence. It's probably carbon dioxide now. Breathing atmosphere that is 15% carbon dioxide would kill you. Let's be clear. It would also raise the temperature of the planet by a fuckload, but we've established by now that none of this was thought through. Like, the outside world in this series is not mentioned a whole lot. Like, we get the pod, we get the general area around the pod. Not a lot outside that. Like, we do hear, though, that apparently in Russia, people trained to live outside, and then they abandoned the pods and just lived outside normally. And 
we also learn later that the pod that this story mostly takes place in, the oxygen levels there are higher than normal, uh, which is like, thir it's about 30% oxygen, they say. And that's bad for you too. Like, like they say they are overfeeding them oxygen, as it were, uh, in order to prevent them from getting used to thin air and being able to leave. But again, having too much oxygen can also be bad for you. That can also damage your organs. And it's also a fire hazard. Because again, they're, they're in an enclosed space. Everything is tight next to each other. If a fire breaks out and there's more oxygen so the fire burns better, that, that's, a bad, that's a bad thing. Things burn easy. What I'm saying overall is that if the environment was really as badly damaged as is described in the book, everything would be absolutely wrecked. Like, there would be no living outside the pod, and hell, there wouldn't even be leaving it for long periods of time. Like, you would probably need protective suits and oxygen tanks. Like, you, it would be almost like a spaceship. But in this book, it, it's supposed to be apocalyptic. The outside world is supposed to seem really horrible and harsh, but it honestly doesn't seem that bad when you take all of this into account. So back with Quinn, uh, all the girls that are nearby are throwing themselves at him because he's just so effortlessly hot and effortlessly cool. And he runs into Alina and sees her briefly and he thinks she's hot and that, that's it. Uh, so then we go to the next chapter, which is Alina's POV again, and she learns that Abel is missing. And th there's no trace of him whatsoever, and she just says, okay, that means he's dead. Like, the Ministry killed him and disappeared him. And Alina realizes, like, okay, I need to leave immediately because they must have found him, found out about our mission, who knows what information they got out of him before they killed him. It's not safe for me here anymore. I need to go outside and find Petra, who is the leader of a rebel cell which is outside the pod. And then right after this, the news comes on, and the news announces that they found Abel's body, found Abel's body while he was trying to destroy machinery. You know, like, it, it looks like he crawled in and there was some sort of accident and he, he just died. That's what they say. And then they have an interview with the pod minister, who is the guy in charge of the entire pod. And your message to the terrorists, pod minister? To the terrorists, I say, run. Run. He looks straight into the camera and grins, because a running citizen is an arrested citizen, unless the runner is a premium with a tank, of course. And the journalist laughs, too. And even the woman sitting in front of us laughs. But I do not. I do not like the joke. This doesn't seem like a time for him to be joking, to be honest. Like, for a dictator, or for any leader, really, this is when you want to be hard and tough. Like, they just caught somebody who they claim was planning a terrorist attack, which could have killed a lot of people, and he's, they're saying, like, hey, we, we got him, you're good, you're safe, and it's all because of me. Like, this is when they want to be hard and tough and spitting fire and saying, we will come after you, you you're with us or you're against us, we're gonna run down the terrorists, etc., that sort of thing. It's also a little strange that the ruling body is called the Ministry and the leader is just called the Minister. You know, you'd think there, there would be several ministers at the ministry, you know, Minister of Finance, Minister of Interior, Minister of Defense, etc. And the guy who's in charge of it all would be, be the Prime Minister. Like, that, that's how most places do it. But, okay, sure, whatever. And his name isn't given right now, he's just the Pod Minister. But soon enough we find out that his name is Kane Knavery. <laughs> uh, attention everyone who is just listening to this while they do something else, please look at the screen for a moment so you can see his name and how it's spelled. <laughs> That's a ridiculous name. Like, you might as well just call him Evil McNasty, you know? Like, this book, this book series, it doesn't have a whole lot of stuff that's so dumb it's funny, but it has a little bit of stuff that's so dumb it's funny. So we go to Quinn, and he goes home, and Kane Knavery is there. Pod Minister Kane Knavery. I'm gonna call him by his whole name every time, because it's beautiful. And Kane Knavery is just visiting Quinn's dad, and like I said, his dad is seemingly in charge of the pod's entire military, but Quinn doesn't know that for whatever reason, so for now he's just high up in the ministry, like he's somebody important. And Kane Knavery and Quinn's dad are just talking to each other, discussing important political stuff, etc. And they're just drinking some whiskey, and they give Quinn a little glass of whiskey too. And he's, he's 16 years old, so that's not too weird to give him a little bit. But they also give Quinn's 
10-year-old siblings whiskey. And that is a little weird. Like, I, I get that this is a different culture and everything, and in some places it's okay to give kids, like, a little sip of wine or something, but whiskey seems really strong for 10-year-olds. I don't know, maybe that's just me. Uh, it's also hinted at at this stage that Kane Navery is an alcoholic, or at least has a very serious drinking problem, because he has a flask with him that he carries around all the time, and he's constantly drinking from it. And it's mentioned a bunch more throughout this whole book, but it never really goes anywhere. So Quinn tries to convince Kane Navery and his dad to accept B into the leadership program, and they don't. And Quinn's dad calls B's parents subs, which is apparently a slur for auxiliaries. And honestly, class-based slurs don't hit that hard. Like, it makes him look like a dick, don't get me wrong, but it, it doesn't feel, like, visceral, you know, the way it would be if it was a slur based on, like, religion or ethnicity or something. And, I don't know, like, it just makes Quinn's dad look like a dick. It doesn't make him look like a sociopath, the way you would expect from a high-ranking member of a dictatorship. It just makes him root. So Alina flees her home. She thinks about how she requested Abel be on the mission with her, and then she thinks, oh my god, it's my fault. I got him killed. It's all my fault. And this never comes back up. Like, I'm, I'm going to be saying that a lot in this book. Like, I mention something and then it just never comes back up, even if it could maybe have been interesting later on, but whatever. And then while she's running, she meets a man in an alleyway and they have an interesting conversation. He snickers and pulls out a short, sharp blade. I've run almost 20 blocks and hate to turn back, but he'll cut me for sure. So I turn around and run. Behind me, he calls out, I wasn't going to hurt a delicious thing like you. Come back, my tasty. What? I think the thin air in this world has given everyone in this book a mental illness. Like, it's a very rare mental illness, and it makes people talk like the bullies from anti-bullying PSAs that I had to watch in elementary school. So Alina is fleeing the pod, and she reaches border security at the same time as Quinn and B, who, remember, they're going out camping. <laughs> Uh, she asks Quinn for help. Like, Alina asks Quinn for help. She's like, hey, uh, I need to get smuggled through border security. Can you help me out? And he, again, he saw her literally once and just thought she was hot, and he agrees. Like, he has no reason to agree to help her, but he just does. And he knows that she did something illegal, and he knows that if he's caught, he'll get in serious trouble, but he just decides to help her anyways. Like, He's supposed to be kind of naive and out of touch, you know? Like, he's he's a spoiled rich kid who doesn't really understand how the lower classes live, and he doesn't understand uh, how difficult this world is sometimes. Like, that, at least I think that's what this book is trying to do with his character. But this just makes it seem like he's a borderline rebel already. Like, he already hates the Ministry and is trying to do everything in his power to stop them, but that, that's not at all what the rest of him says. Like, ask yourself. You are crossing the border into another country. Maybe you're alone, maybe you're with some loved ones. And as you're coming up to security, a stranger who you think is attractive, but they are still a stranger, they come up and they ask you to help smuggle them across the border. What would your reaction be? <clears throat> Most people would probably tell them to fuck off. So Quinn makes a really big scene. He pretends that Alina is his girlfriend and that she forgot her ID and he tells the guards to let her through because his dad is important. He's like, I don't want to have to run all the way back home and grab it, and my dad's important, let me through. Like, that's essentially what it comes down to. And the border guards agree if he bribes them with some oxygen tanks. And he agrees to give them the tanks. Like, it's the one kind of nice thing that he does throughout the series. And one of the guards, though, mentions that he doesn't have enough air to dance with his wife, even, which is really, really stupid. Like. If you're soldiers and police, and just security forces, I guess, would be the generic term, if they're not well taken care of, you're gonna get overthrown. Like, especially if it's a dictatorship. Like, those guys should be swimming in air while all the peasants aren't even allowed to run or dance, you know? Otherwise, how can you be sure that they'll be willing to shoot the angry mob when it starts marching on the palace? You know, just... Cops in the U.S. make six figures, not even counting their benefits. Like, that's how the government knows it can count on them to kill the peasants who start getting uppity. Anyways, the three of them escape the pod without any further trouble. So we go to part two, the Outlands. And they hike for a while, with no clear goal in sight. 
like, Alina is obviously going off to meet Petra and the other rebels, but there's, there, where, why are the other two with her? They're, I don't know, but they're, they're just hiking for a while, and B becomes increasingly jealous of how Alina is prettier than her, and she might steal Quinn away from her. Sorry, my phone is vibrating a lot, it's uncomfortable. And based on that, you might be afraid that a love triangle is going to come up, but no, nah, don't worry, it doesn't, it doesn't emerge, but it does make B look a little pathetic at this stage. Like, she just teamed up with a terrorist, and that's what she's focusing on. She's focusing on how the terrorist is pretty and might steal her boyfriend. Like, girl, there's more important shit to worry about. And Quinn mentions that, like, they're talking about what weapons they have to protect themselves from drifters. So, like, they know that this is a threat. Quinn mentions he has one knife, which he brought, specifically to protect himself from drifters. And he also mentions that they do have a hammer for their tent pegs, which they can use if they need to. So, that's all they brought. He didn't bring a gun. He didn't bring a machete or an axe. He didn't even bring a second knife for B. He really, really didn't think this through. And that's even stranger because he's the child of a high-ranking member of the government, which means he's, like, vulnerable to kidnapping or assassination or something. Like, he should have some security with him. Like, I feel like he sh there should just be a bodyguard who tails him 24 hours of the day, you know what I mean? And as they're hiking, they're going through the ruins of some old city. Uh, the specific city is never mentioned, it's just an old city. And uh, all the stuff near the pod is cleared, so that's like just open wasteland. Uh, but then they start going through like ruined buildings and such, and Alina is leading the way. Again, I have to ask why. Because... They helped her, you know, they, they did her a solid, they helped smuggle her through border security, that makes sense, and now she can go to the Rebels. I feel like they should just part ways now. Like, they'd say, okay, we helped you, we're gonna go camping now, and then she goes off and does her own thing. But they're not, they're just, they are just with her, they're ride or die at this stage with, uh, uh Alina. <laughs> God, these characters are so generic, I keep getting them mixed up. But, yeah, B and Quinn are just ride or die with Alina now, for no reason, like, Whoops! The author forgot that the characters need to have motivation to do things and not just get pushed around by the plot. That's so easy to forget. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be sarcastic. That is an easy thing to forget. So in your own writing, try not to. But really, there is no reason for either B or Quinn to take this, this route. There's no reason for them to suddenly be okay with ter terrorism, as they think of it, and be okay with joining up with rebels. Like, they just... They just want to do that now. Like, this is either remarkably lazy or remarkably clumsy writing. It's, it's almost impressive in a way. Uh, so then we get Alina chapter, and she gives some exposition about how the world ended. It's a little better than I was expecting it to be, but it's still not great. You know, oxygen levels plummeted because all the trees and plants were dying. People started dying from it because, oh, there's not enough air to breathe. And then governments started building pods and rationing the air. And they did manage to build the pods and save some people, but in the end, only some people could be saved. Only a few. A lot more died. And the thing that caught me off guard, though, was that Alina's grandparents were there. Like, they were not only alive during the Switch, but they were adults during the Switch. So, the dy this dystopia is only a few decades old. The apocalypse wasn't that long ago. And, I, I don't know, like, like I said, this... This whole backstory of the apocalypse is not as bad as it could have been, all things considered. Like, the author thought about it at least a little bit. So it starts raining outside, and remember, all three of them are together, and Alina goes into an abandoned house to escape the rain, and she also wants to find a weapon, because she didn't have time to bring one and she couldn't smuggle it through security. So again, it's raining, and of these three people, one goes inside to escape the rain, and the others just wait outside for her instead of going in with her to also escape the rain. So Alina strips down, she finds an old knife in the kitchen, and then she hears a noise upstairs and goes to investigate, and there's an old woman there. And this woman attacks her, trying to steal her oxygen tank, and she doesn't manage to do it. The others come in to help her, and they subdue the old woman. Uh, her name is Maud, and she whines for a bit. Uh, she, she talks about how she was exiled many years ago. She's a drifter now. And she was given, like, this really big respirator, which will create air for her, so she wouldn't just die right away. Uh, but it's really big, and she's too old to carry it anymore. 
So now she can't go around in the area and scavenge for food or anything, and she's slowly dying. And Alina and Quinn basically say, oh, sucks to suck, and then they want to leave her there, but B decides to take her with them. And this is when she started to grow on me a little. You know, she, she doesn't really have any motivation for wanting to help this lady other than being a good person and just knowing this is probably the right thing to do. Uh, but, you know, at least she is doing the right thing when she has the opportunity. So they keep moving for a while, and then Quinn says this. We've been walking for more than two hours, and I think I've spent one hour looking at Alina's ass and another hour trying not to look at it. I have to be careful, though, when Alina glances around, not to let her see me staring. Okay, Quinn's POV, his narration is at least a little different than the others, you know? He is a weirdo, and he's an ass man. So that's something, I guess. In fact, most of the weird lines in these books, there's not a whole lot of them, but most of them are in Quinn's POV chapters. So they all keep heading towards the Rebel Stronghold, which is just called The Grove, and Alina says it's built in an old soccer stadium. And while they're traipsing through the ruined city, a tank with some soldiers in it rolls nearby. Tanks aren't supposed to go anywhere alone, actually. Like, especially not in urban environments. Like. I'm not sure why they sent this tank through in the first place, maybe it was just a patrol, but that's a stupid way to do it. Because, again, in any environment, but especially in urban environments, there are just a lot of places for ambushes. It's very easy for somebody to just pop out with an RPG and then blow the tank away. Like, life pro tip for anyone who's ever running a military operation. Tanks need infantry support or those tanks are gonna die. But anyways, the tank notices them, and then Quinn goes and talks to the soldiers for a bit, and for whatever reason, he runs. Like, again, he has no reason to, like, be afraid of the soldiers or to hate the pod or to join up with the rebels or anything, but he really doesn't want to get taken home by the soldiers. And he runs away, and then they fire at the building he's in for a bit, and it collapses on top of him. Okay, that seems... That seems excessive to me. You know, like, it's one guy, and they just fire a bunch of tank shells into this building which collapses it just to kill one day. It's like, do they also kill mice with landmines? The others all run though, and they manage to escape through the old subway tunnels. And then we have a bunch of rapid shifts back and forth between Quinn chapters and B chapters. And every chapter is like one or two pages, and B's parts are mostly sitting there thinking, Quinn! I'm so sad Quinn is dead, I loved him! And then Quinn's chapters are him sitting there thinking, man, I really wish I didn't get buried alive. And eventually, two people come by named Silas and Inger, who are, uh, Silas is Alina's cousin, and he's also a rebel. And they, they come by and they save him. Part three, the resistance. I'm, I'm gonna stop announcing the new parts. They really don't add much, but, you know, there's, there's parts in these books. Ooh. So Alina, B, and Maud come across the tank again, and the soldiers are still looking for them, so they abandon the tank to search the ruins, and then the girls jump in the tank, steal it, and drive off. First of all, it's not that easy to control a tank. You need some training to be able to do it. And secondly, those soldiers are fucking dumb. Like, they're on the look for fugitives, and they know they're nearby, or at least think they're nearby, and then they just leave their tank unguarded with the engine running. Like, I don't know if tanks actually have keys in them, but like this is the equivalent of just leaving the keys in the ignition. That's stupid. And then Quinn is traveling with Silas and Inger, and he decides to say this. You know those films where a guy wakes up next to some girl, then creeps out of bed and kind of skulks off because he doesn't want to have an awkward conversation? Well, it's not exactly the same thing, but I have that awkward feeling when I wake up to Silas and Inger. What the hell did you just say? No, I, I don't think I know what you're talking about there, bro. So then the three of them run from an entire military convoy which has shown up, not just the one lone tank. It's like tanks, APCs, helicopters that are all come in this direction for whatever reason, and they try running from it, and they are hiding in buildings. But they have infrared vision, so Silas tells him, hey, if we're gonna hide, we have to get colder. So they like all take their clothes off and start shivering and getting really cold, which that is the exact opposite of what you're supposed to do if you're trying to hide from infrared vision. Like, if your body temperature drops low enough to blend in with the environment, you'll die. Like, you will freeze to death if your body temperature actually gets that low. Like, you want to do the opposite. You want to cover up and prevent heat from escaping. So, like, for, for example, during the occupation of Afghanistan, 
uh, the U.S. and coalition forces had infrared cameras on drones and stuff, so to hide from them, the Taliban would just, like, lay out on a hot rock and then throw a blanket over themselves so that they couldn't be seen that easy. Secondly, these tanks and helicopters should have used infrared earlier. Like, they were looking for Quinn and them when they were just running from that one tank. They should have used it then. But okay. And third, how does the pod have this much military equipment? Because it's just, it's described as if there's like dozens of tanks and helicopters, but that requires a lot of resources and technical know-how. Like just for one or two tanks to be run from this pod would take a lot of time, energy, and resources. Like the pod is described as a single city and it's described as like barely keeping itself afloat but it can have this massive military force. Like, that doesn't make sense. For, like, in the real world, the Netherlands is a pretty wealthy country, and as of 2022, it had 18 tanks in service. Like, not 1,800, 18. And that's an entire, uh, not huge country, but an entire country with a lot of money to throw around. This convoy also passes by B and the others, and they hide inside the tank that they stole, I feel like the engine heat should have given them away there. But what do I know? So Silas tells Quinn that they need to get to the Grove quick and they can't share any more air with him. They've been sharing their oxygen tanks. And so they find this big respirator, which is like the one Maud had. It's too big to carry around. And they just hook him up to it, put his mask on, say, hey, we'll be back in a couple of days. And he's like, but there's not enough food or anything. They're like, yeah, you're just going to have to deal with it. And they just, they just leave him there. And uh, a little while later, some soldiers come by, and Quinn flags them down, and he claims he was kidnapped by the rebels, and they say, oh, cool, and they just save him. And these soldiers are led by a general with a helmet on, so they can't see his face. And this is Quinn's dad. Like, it... I don't know why they insisted on making this a twist, is the thing. Like, it should have just been Quinn knows his dad is in charge of the military, but he thinks that's a good thing, and he's happy about it, and then later he sees his dad do terrible stuff and is upset by it, because the, the twist as it is now just doesn't work. So right after this, uh, there is some vegetation nearby, like trees, bushes, and stuff. Some of it, I think, was natural, and some was planted by the rebels. I don't know, not important, but the soldiers all pull out some containers, and they spray herbicide all over the place, just killing all the plants. And at first, I saw this and I was like, that is really weird. Like, that's just making your evil government evil for no reason. But then I thought about it and I was like, well, okay, making a tree-killing chemical would take uh, more resources and it'd be hard to keep secret. And it seems like fire would be easier. But then I was also like, okay, the air is super thin, so it wouldn't burn easy, fair enough. And also I thought about it some more and I was like, okay, this prevents the world from healing, and it puts continued strain on the pod and the government and its resources, but remember, what is good for the people or the country is not always what's good for the people who are in charge. Like, if air outside was abundant and free, then people could just leave the pod. Like, the ministry would lose control. And the books acknowledge this too. Like, they straight up say, yeah, the ministry doesn't want things to heal, because they want to maintain control over the population. And if it's possible to leave, then they can just run away from their control. And they don't want that. And the books acknowledge that. Like, they straight up say, yeah, this government's evil, but it is also rational. It's acting in its own self-interest. And that, that's part of why I don't hate these books. You know, they have a few moments of intelligence sprinkled in there. Very few, but they're there. So then Quinn finds out that the general is his dad, Again, we already knew his dad worked for Kane Knavery, who was evil, so this doesn't make us think much differently of him. And then Inger gets killed, and Silas and Quinn run off. And in another version of this book, like a, a better version of this book, this would be the moment where Quinn decided that the Ministry was evil and he joins the Rebels. Like, he would think that they're good people doing good things, and he just wound up getting swept up in this adventure by mistake. And then, at this point, he realizes, oh, okay, you guys are evil, so he just joins up with the rebels. Like, if, if from this moment he decided to act like that, that would make sense, but he was doing it before, where it didn't make sense. So Alina and the others finally reach the grove, and, like, 
like they said earlier, it's an old soccer stadium, which is full of trees and rebels. And we got Maud's backstory at one point, which is actually not bad. Basically, before the Switch, she was a nurse, and when a lot of people realized, like, hey, we're not gonna be saved, there's not enough room in the pods and everything, uh, she helped them kill themselves. Like, she did a bunch of assisted suicide, and that was horrible for her, it was horrible for them, uh, but the pod ministry doesn't want word of that getting out, so they exiled her to keep her from telling anyone. It's actually not a bad backstory. Uh, and then Alina meets with Petra, who is the leader of the Rebels, and she just explains everything that happened, and B and Maud are taken prisoner just in case, which, again, makes sense. Like, they don't know them, they can't trust them. And Petra tells Alina, though, that she started a war, and by that she means the Ministry is going to come for them soon, which is... I straight up don't understand what she meant by that or why. Like, the war was already ongoing. Like, rebels are being killed, they're making strongholds outside of ministry control, they're trying to undermine the ministry's authority. Why would the ministry all of a sudden now want to attack? Because the main characters are involved now, I guess. Like, the entire plot revolves around them, I suppose. That's like saying World War II didn't begin until America joined. You know, or, well, <laughs> I guess our education system is bad enough that a lot of Americans probably do believe that, but it's not true. Like, the Ministry didn't know about the Grove before, or they didn't know where it was, or they didn't think it was worth the effort to attack. Like, one, at least one of those three, three things has to be true. But now they do know where it is, and they do know it exists, and they do think it's worth the effort to attack. Why do they think that? Like, no nothing changed. You know, as far as we can tell, Alina and the others, like, weren't followed by anyone who reported back to base or anything. Like, they just... It, it, they're, they're under attack now, because the main characters are there. This is just the book taking really big moments and throwing them in without taking the time to actually justify them. So instead of hitting with, like, the big impact they're supposed to hit with, it just... You just hit with a shrug, you know? It just, it just doesn't work. And yeah, the army basically is about to come to the Grove. The Rebels, they do have some weapons, but nothing heavy. You know, they don't have anything to take out air power. They don't have anything to take out heavy armor. No, nothing like that. Uh, so then Quinn arrives along with Silas and everybody trains for a while. Not much happens in this bit, to be honest. Like this, this, this whole section of the book is pretty dull. Like, Quinn and B get sent back to the pod, they pretend that they've been kidnapped, and Quinn's parents try to make, get him to marry Kane Navery's daughter, whose name is Neom Navery. <laughs> Once again, please look at the screen to see how this thing is spelled. And then Maud and Alina go out for a while and recruit some drifters to the rebels. It's, it's a great way to throw out any excitement that you may have felt up before this point. Like, it, it's like watching the thing and then during the blood testing scene, it cuts to the chest bursting scene from Alien. They're both good on their own, but they keep distracting from one another. So, back in the pod, Quinn is supposed to give a press conference where he just, you know, talks to the cameras and it gets broadcast on the news. And he's supposed to talk about his experience with the Rebels and how horrible it was. It's basically supposed to make people hate the Rebels and see them as evil terrorists. And meanwhile, the army is going to attack the Grove and destroy it and kill everyone there. And during the conference, Quinn just decides to go off script. Like, he tells everybody about how the Ministry is killing all the trees and how they're being overfed oxygen because they don't want them going outside and it is possible to live outside. And people get really mad about that. And they start yelling and protesting. And then Kane Knavery has the police crack down violently and then it turns into a riot. Which is how most protests turn into riots, to be honest. So the riots escalate and go completely nuts and consume the entire pod. And Kane Knavery winds up being killed in the chaos, which is dumb, because Kane Knavery was the only villain we had up until this point. Like, he wasn't good, but we did know him, and he was at least starting to have something resembling a personality. And after this, he's replaced with a totally new character, which is just annoying, because that totally new character fills the exact same role in the story but we also have zero chance to get to know him, slash hate him, slash fear him. And while the riot is going on, B's parents are killed, and then she escapes the pod and runs off into the wasteland. 
Meanwhile, the army attacks the Grove, and Quinn's dad, again, the guy in charge of their entire military, is leading from the front line. And Petra, the leader of the rebels, is also leading. Like, both of the leaders are in the middle of the fighting. Which, that, that's not how modern warfare works. It's just too dangerous, it's too risky. That's like if Donald Rumsfeld personally led the U.S. invasion of Iraq and at one point got into a shootout with Saddam Hussein and the Republican Guard. Like, it's just, if that sounds weird and stupid, that's because it is. So Alina's at the battle, and she shoots an advancing so soldier, and she spends about two sentences feeling bad about her first murder, which, it, it's not a murder. Like, your soldier's in a war. It's a horrible thing to kill somebody, I'll give you that, but it, it's not murder. That's not what that word means. But then this also just never comes back up, which is kind of annoying, you know? Like, again, these characters have so little personality, I would rather have Alina start angsting over killing people <clears throat> if she's going to angst about killing people, you know? Have it go on for a bit and have her learn and develop from that, or just have her not be bothered by it too much. Now, one good detail here, which I did like and did make me kind of like the ending of this first book, is that the rebels just get completely stomped in this battle. Like, it is completely one-sided. They, they do very little damage to the Ministry soldiers, and they are almost completely wiped out. And that makes total sense, because they have no anti-tank weaponry, they have no anti-air weaponry, they have very little protection from a modern military in a straight-up fight. Like, that's, that's why they were an insurgency before this point. That's why they were sneaking around stealing clippings from trees and stuff. Like, that they can't just straight up fight them. And it would have been smarter, admittedly, for them to just run and, like, maybe leave a bunch of booby traps at the grove to try and kill some soldiers while they're there. But, like, they just, they had no chance of winning. It would have been better for them to just get out of dodge. Like, I don't know, they just, too many stories like this would have had them come up with some sort of BS plan that saved the day, but they just had no options here. Like, it, modern military might is just way too overwhelming to people who have nothing but some rifles and shotguns. Like, the deck is too stacked against them. But, here's the thing, this is meant to be like the low point cliffhanger, which leads into the sequel, so I don't think this was done out of a sense of military realism, you know? Like, I think this was good on accident, is what I'm saying, because if this were done out of a sense of military realism, then they wouldn't have had much of an actual battle. Like, it, they send in, in regular infantry there, regular soldiers with guns to attack, and Alina is shooting at them, like I said, but it would have been smart to just stand back a couple of kilometers and bombard it. Like, it's not as if they're trying to capture the grove, or it's not as if the rebels have any hostages or anything valuable there. There's nothing valuable nearby the grove that they don't want to have that they want to avoid destroying. It's a ruined city. It's a wasteland. So they can just stand back a while, fire at it with their tanks and helicopters until there's nothing left, and then maybe send some infantry in to clear up what's left. So the army is able to destroy the entire grove. Like, they blow up a bunch, and then they spray what's left with herbicide. Uh, but because of the riot back at the pod, they do have to uh, stop the attack early and go back to put down the riot. So they aren't able to stick around and hunt down all the survivors, which means some of them are able to escape. Like, again, th that actually makes sense, hey. And uh, like I said, B escapes the pod, Quinn is arrested, but then his father comes and talks to him in his cell, and he's like, hey, they're gonna execute you for what you did. You got Kane Knavery, the pod minister, killed. So I'm just gonna throw you outside now with a little bit of air, and just good luck out there, kid. And... He, he releases him, he goes out, and apparently everyone is heading west to a place called Sequoia, which is like another rebel stronghold somewhere far away. Like, Alina's heading there, B and Quinn somehow heard about it, and they're heading there. And that's the end of book one. So, like I said, it's bad, but it's not the worst thing ever. It is just stupid, stupid and silly. You know, I, I wish it had been third person instead of different POVs. Like, that would have made it better. If the characters had a bit more personality... That would have been better. If the world had been changed to make more sense, that would have made it a little bit better. Like, etc. you know? It's close to being good at times. It's a bad book, but it's not unsalvageable. But even the few bits that are good in here, like the final battle, like I said, it's overshadowed by just how monumentally dumb all of the science is. Like, 
at the end of this copy of the book, there is a Q&A section with the author, and the author says that she heard oxygen being depleted is very plausible, and she hopes it doesn't happen. It's not plausible, guys. Like, putting more CO2 into the atmosphere is bad, but the idea that we're going to suffocate is not how it works. And, I don't know. Whatever. Anyways, uh, now we move on to book two, which is called Resist. And this is, like I said, the last one. There's, there's only two. And this one is worse than the first book, to be honest. Like, the, all the funny bad things, like the science, is already past. So now this one is just a con continuation of the war story. Well, sort of. Like, by the time we get to the climax, th the climax of the series is just complete nonsense, with several different villains coming and going in very quick succession. So, like I was saying earlier, we can't get attached to any of them. Uh, there's a focus on sexual assault near the end of this one. And re remember that dude in the alley who called Alina my tasty? That seemed to briefly imply a threat of sexual assault, but now it's like a major part of the story for both B and Alina. So that's, uh, that's not good. Like I said, though, I do like the cover. It has greenery now. You can see the wasteland healing, it, which is showing like, hey, the world is being saved. And there's a tagline at the top which says, fight until your last breath, which, eh, I, I liked it. It kind of worked. So, like I said, it's not a total loss, and we'll go over some more later. So once again, we start with an Alina chapter. She is on a boat with some other rebels, and Silas is being a sad boy because the grove is gone, and everything we fought for is gone, which, like, no? Le le you're going to Sequoia because there's more rebels there, like, you're... You're leaving to fight another day. You, you survived, but okay, whatever. And Alina says that even days later, she can taste the toxic foam that destroyed the trees, meaning she would have had to swallow or inhale some. That sounds cancerlicious to me. So one of the rebels, a woman named Holly, tries to kill herself by jumping off the ship. And then Alina saves her. And then later she escapes the room where they were holding her and she kills herself for real. I guess it's kind of sad, but the fact that we don't know anything about Holly or who she is kind of robs it of any impact. And uh, then we go to B, who is only focusing on very important things. When I pined for Quinn, I thought I knew what people meant when they talked about having broken hearts. I didn't know a thing. Now my insides are all eaten up. My heart pumps what little ox oxygen I have around my body, but the breath doesn't make me whole. Girl, there's a time and a place. Right now you are wandering the wasteland without enough oxygen. This is not the time or the place to be pining after your old boyfriend, kind of. Like, just the dude you had a crush on who you're also friends with. Like, imagine if someone tied a cinder block around your ankle and threw you in the ocean, and then you started wondering if it was a good idea to eat that gas station sushi for dinner last night. Like, you, you have more pressing issues. She also says that nobody in the pod believes in God anymore, which is kind of dumb. Like, I don't think religion would completely vanish in this world, especially not so soon after the apocalypse. And anyways, her and Quinn are wandering for a while and they find Jazz, who is one of the rebels who survived the battle at the Grove, and Jazz is wounded, so they try to help her. And then we are finally introduced to the fourth and last POV character, whose name is Ronan. His full name is Ronan Knavery because he's Kane Knavery's son. He is a member of the Special Forces, which I assume means he's a highly trained soldier, and he is completely okay with his dad being killed in the riots. Like, yeah, he he already knew about all the worst parts of the government, and he hates it, because he was actually at the Grove at the battle, and he helped destroy the trees. So it takes zero effort, literally zero effort, to move him to the rebels' side later on. Like, it, it would have been kind of neat to see things from the other side, you know, maybe... Maybe we could see how soldiers are indoctrinated or otherwise kept in line by the government. Maybe see Ronan be super patriotic and think, yes, the ministry is doing the right thing, and then realize that he's wrong and change over time. Like, that that could have been neat, but we just throw all that out, and he's just a good guy from the beginning, which is so much less interesting. So Ronan and his sister, Neom Knavery, are under house arrest, and they're not al allowed to leave for their own protection and they have communications very restricted, so they can't watch the news or anything, they have no idea of what's going on outside. And it's, it's so horrible, like, their servant is not allowed in, so they have to feed themselves for the first time in their lives. That is 
the horror, let me tell you. So then Quinn's dad, the general, his, his real name is Jude, by the way, comes in and he tells them the uprising was put down and the riots are over. Like, they pumped a bunch of gas into the streets, which knocked people unconscious. I don't know why that would take several days to do. That seems like something that would take, like, an hour, but okay, whatever. And Ronan just wants to quit the army. Like, he's like, okay, I don't want to fight for people who are destroying trees and making the world worse just to protect their own power. But the general won't let him. And then we go back to B and Quinn. And Quinn leaves B with Jazz to take care of her, make sure she doesn't die. And then he's going to go to Sequoia and then try and bring back help and medical care. And then we go back to Ronan. This is part of why I hate having multiple first-person POV characters. Like, authors never pace the storylines correctly and they keep getting in each other's way. So the general wants to send out Ronan to search for rebels. And he's sending out Ronan and the other junior special forces to search for rebels because the rebels would trust young people. Sure. I, and I don't know why they're called the junior special forces because most special forces operators are pretty young. Like, in fact, most frontline soldiers in general are young men. Like, they're not like in movies where they're all 45. Like, they're 20 years old at the most a lot of times. Like, so hearing Junior Special Forces makes me imagine a bunch of seven-year-old kids wearing combat fatigues. And while they're on the trip outside, the general talks with Ronan for a bit. And he says, hey, I can't let you just quit the army. But I can get you and Quinn both new identities and help you get new lives so you can start over and live as auxiliaries. All you have to do is bring back Quinn alive. Which doesn't make sense. Like, again, I was approaching this like the pod was just a single city and not even a particularly big one. Like, maybe a million people at the very most and they're all crammed into a tight space. So it seems like it would be very difficult to disappear and start up a new life there. You know, because you would almost certainly run into somebody who knew you and even if you didn't, you would just like appear one day and people would be like, hey, I don't remember that guy. Like, y you know, that's... That's weird. So their plan is kind of stupid, but the general also just throws Ronan out there without actually confirming that he likes the plan and agrees to it. He just tells him, hey, call me when you find Quinn, and that's it. I also don't know why he didn't just get Quinn a new identity earlier. Like, he threw him out of the pod and into the wasteland instead of just getting him a new life, which he apparently can do, but whatever. And then B stays with Jazz for a long time, worrying about how she might die. I am not sure how long those two are down there. The others are still traveling for what seems like a week, maybe. And this is all supposed to be happening simultaneously. But at the same time, when you read through B's section, it sounds like she's there for like a day and a half at most. It, I don't know. These, these timelines don't add up. And that's part of why having multiple POV characters and multiple interlocking storylines is a tricky thing to do. So Alina finally finds Sequoia with the other rebels, and they are all led inside. It's like, again, just a, another rebel stronghold. It's different than the Grove, but it's, it's there. They're, they're let inside. They're safe now. And Quinn travels through the ruined city by himself for a while. It's, it's more ruined since the battle. And upon reading that, I realized, like, yeah, we didn't get a whole lot of description of what the city actually looks like. You know, like, how crumbling are the buildings? Is it all dust and sand, or is it something else? You know, it would have been kind of nice to get that, but whatever. It's more ruined since the battle, and he runs into two people. He runs into Joe, a pregnant girl who seems really young, like 15 or 16 at most, and Abel, who was Alina's old boyfriend, who supposedly died early on in the first book. This twist leads nowhere, and it doesn't make any sense. How did Abel wind up surviving? I don't know, we don't get much of his backstory, like he just, I guess, ran off at some point, but then it doesn't make sense why the government would declare him dead in public. Like, if he, unless they knew for certain he was dead, they wouldn't say, yeah, we killed this guy, because if he was found to be alive later, they would look stupid. It would make much more sense for them to just say, hey, uh, this terrorist tried to do this bad thing and we tried to catch him, but he escaped and he's on the run now, so be on the lookout. Like, that's what governments do a lot of the time. They tell them, hey, there's a threat out there. Only I can protect you from the threat. So don't do anything to threaten my power or else the bad thing will come and get you and you'll die. Ooh. Like, that, that's what they do all the time. 
so th this would be like if the day after 9-11, the U.S. government just said, Hey, Osama bin Laden's dead now. We're, we got him. And then, like, two days later, bin Laden just put out a video saying, Hey, I'm actually not dead. Like, that, that is what this is like. So anyways, Joe, Abel, and Quinn all travel to Sequoia together. And then over at Sequoia, Alina meets with the leader, who is a man named Max. <laughs> Please look at the screen to see how that is spelled for just a moment. Like, <laughs> that's an amazing name. Like, it's, it's a totally normal name, but they insist on spelling it weird. It's like that, that meme with that pregnant lady with a chalkboard with all the weird names on it. It's, it's like that. Now, Max is kind of creepy, and he's like creepily staring at Alina and some other girls and hugging them just a little too long, you know, things like that. And it's mentioned that he really didn't like Petra, who was the other rebel leader at the Grove who died during the battle at the last book. And I actually kind of like that detail. You know, the rebels have divisions here. Like, even though uh, Max's crew and Petra's crew at the Grove were both fighting the Ministry, they weren't really working together. They, they didn't like each other, and that's very realistic. Like, revolutions do have splits like that. Because Petra basically just wanted to try and restore the environment to show people it's possible to live outside and then they would all just like leave that would undermine the the ministry's power without firing a shot ideally whereas max his faction well at first it seems like he just wants to violently overthrow the ministry really max is a cult leader and he wants to build a harem and then later he wants to violently overthrow the ministry and he also wants to destroy the pod. It's... I don't know. Like, again, it's nice that they have this division, but it's not handled super well. Like, it's not a super deep exploration of why these revolutions fracture. You know, usually it's about why they rebel in the first place, because when there's a dictatorship, they make a lot of different enemies all across the political spectrum. Like, you know, some rebels uh, are religious extremists, some are socialists, some are liberals, you know, things like that. And if the people fighting against the pod ministry were like that, then that would make a bit more sense. But, I don't know, for a minute it's nice to have. And also, while Quinn is traveling with Joe, we find out that her baby's dad is actually Max, and she just refers to him as Vile, and Quinn doesn't ask a whole lot of questions beyond that, but, you know, it's, it makes it clear that, oh, Max is bad. It's, it's awkward foreshadowing, but at least it's there. And back at Sequoia, again, we just keep having to go back and forth, Back at Sequoia, the others are tested for fertility, which is hinting that something nefarious is going on, but it's... It, uh, we don't know what right now, just something bad. Uh, and the people there also have this weird... I, I don't want to say religious reverence, but like they have a strong spiritual connection with nature. And they seem to think that like, trees and plants and everything are very, very important. And it could have been neat, but it's never really expanded on. We acknowledge that nature has more power than we do, Dorian explains. Okay, it clearly doesn't, though, because you destroyed nature. Literally just look outside, dude. So Ronan, the soldier who was sent out to look for Quinn, uh, does not find Quinn, but he does find B and Jazz, where they're hiding, and he calls in some help, and B Jazz is taken away for medical care, and then him and B go on to Sequoia. And finally, Quinn reaches Sequoia, and... Alina is super happy that Abel, her old boyfriend, is alive. Nothing comes of this, so like I said, the plot twist was meaningless, but she's happy that he's alive. And we also find out that Joe originally ran off, but then decided she couldn't live out in the wasteland, especially not being heavily pregnant, and it turns out, like I said, Max is her baby daddy, and he just hits her across the face so hard that she falls to the ground in front of everybody, so again, we know, yep, he's evil and controlling. Uh, again, it's not like super heavily foreshadowed or anything that he's evil. It's just telling us he's evil, but at least it is telling us before he goes full cuckoo by the end. So then we go back to B and Ronan, who are still on their way to Sequoia because we are still trying to get the story going. Like we're almost halfway through the book and the story has not even really started yet. So some drifters attack, and they attempt to sexually assault B, and they don't. They, they attempt to, but they don't do it because Ronan shoots two of them, and then the last one, B kills with a pitchfork. And I don't like this. I don't like that they put this in there. Because 
it's just so cheap to have a character who was largely independent and proactive up until this point, but now she has to be saved by someone else. Like, it feels almost like this scene is there to reassure us that Ronin is definitely the good guy and we don't need to worry about him betraying anybody. And maybe that would work, but we see things from his perspective. Like, there's no doubt whose side he's on, so we're not worrying, we're not wondering. But, I don't know, at the very least, B does get to do something here. Like, she kills someone, and then she feels awful about it for a bit, but then she understands, like, okay, it needed to be done. And so she accepts it and moves on. Like, like I said, she has a little bit of personality to her. She is the one who decided to save Maude. She's the one that stayed behind with Jazz with no uh, confirmation that she would ever get out of there. Like, maybe Quinn would die on the way, or maybe he wouldn't be able to bring help back or something, and she would just be stuck there. But she decided to stay behind with her. She's always striving to be decent. And making her helpless for one scene might be fine if she was the protagonist and she got a whole bunch of time to shine, but she barely gets any time to shine here as is, so giving her one scene of helplessness really detracts from all the good stuff. So finally, Quinn, who is at Sequoia, gets in a helicopter with some soldiers and flies off to pick up B, and now things can fucking happen. But that's still dumb, because first, there's no way that the Rebels could have a helicopter. Like, they would need fuel, and if there's fuel for helicopters, that means someone is drilling for oil and refining it. Like, if the pod has helicopters, like, sure, I'm willing to accept that they have some oil somewhere that they're drilling for and that they're refining it, or they have, like, storage from before the switch or something. Like, that's believable enough, but the Rebels, no, there, there's no way they'd have the resources to do that. And on top of that, helicopters need about four hours of maintenance for every one hour of flight. And it's not easy to learn how to do all that maintenance, and it's also not easy to uh, produce all the spare parts needed. Like, there's no way the Rebels would have all of this. That's somewhat believable for the pod, but it is way, way outside the realm of possibility for the Rebels. And secondly, I defaulted... Because so many books in during this young adult dystopian boom all just took place in the ruins of the United States, I just defaulted to thinking that this took place in the U.S., like everybody was American. Uh, but they mentioned that the helicopter used to belong to the RAF. And they don't straight up say what the RAF is, but I assume it means Royal Air Force, like the British Air Force, uh, not the Red Army faction. That was, a, that was a very different thing. So there's an RAF helicopter nearby, and they also use some English slang. So I think this story takes place in Great Britain. Britain. But then there's also points which make it seem like it kind of takes place in the U.S. Like, they call ski masks balaclavas. Like, the, we, we don't call them balaclavas in the U.S. usually. Uh, but then they also say soccer instead of football. And at one point they mention that the drinking age is 21, whereas it's 18 over there. I, I don't know, like, it doesn't make a lot of difference either way. But it is a failure of world building because the environment and the surroundings of the characters is so vague that it could be in either place, and those are very different places. So Alina and Silas decide, you know what, Max sucks, we're gonna leave Sequoia now. Uh, but he confirms, oh no, you're all prisoners now. You, you don't get to leave. Like, the place is a baby mill because they need to pump out more people and grow the population as much as possible no reason for wanting to grow the population is ever given. They just they just want to do it. Like, there's, there's something about wanting to breed people who can live in this environment and thrive in this new world with very low oxygen. But again, normal people can train themselves to live out in the very low oxygen areas. So, I, I don't understand why you would need to breed more people with that trait. It doesn't make any sense. And so now the story is just about Alina and the others trying to escape from Sequoia for some reason. Like, I, I thought this story was about them fighting against the evil government, but I guess not. And also just to reassure us that Max is evil, he marries Alina against her will. And this is what happens on their wedding night. I'm sleeping on the floor, I say. Fine, he says. Joe did that for a year. Eventually, she jumped into bed with me, and it had nothing to do with the cold. He pulls his shirt over his head and reveals his chest. Maybe he thinks I'll be won over by his body. 
I look away and lie down on the floor. Oh, great. Now both women POV characters in this book have the threat of sexual assault thrown at them for cheap character development. Great, great. Like that. I mean, neither of them ever get assaulted, thankfully, but like, could the author not think of anything else? Jeez. Like, it's just... I don't know, it, it is so odd to me that this rebellion slash war story is suddenly about escaping a cult who didn't exist until a few minutes ago. And Quinn is held prisoner too, and they all plan to go back to the pod and get his dad to help launch a coup slash uprising. It's actually never made clear if he wants to just take the military, overthrow the ministry as it is, and then make things better, which would be a coup, there'd be very little fighting or he just wants to start a general uprising where everybody comes together and there's a big battle. Like, it's never made clear which they want to do, but okay, whatever. So Ronan and B go back to the pod to help with the plan, and this line needs to be heard. What does that girl do to people? He asks. What do you mean? B Whitcraft turns boys into men. What? What, what is he even saying there? Is, is he calling her a slut? So we go back and forth between preparation for the uprising at the pod and the escape from Sequoia. Uh, to avoid going back and forth too much, let's just go over the escape from Sequoia first. Uh, Alina kills somebody named Crab and then buries him, and uh, this doesn't come back later. Uh, she learns that Max is planning on attacking the pod with his rebels, and they're going to cut the tubing on the air recycling stations, which would cut off the air supply and just kill everyone there and the characters decide that they have to stop him because he, like, he's just the antagonist now. Like, Kane Knavery is gone, so I guess they needed somebody. And then Alina and Quinn break out all the pregnant women and babies and other people who are hanging out in the medical wing. And they do it at night, so they're all like super quiet and everything and most people are sleeping. And most of the people who they break out seemed fine with the situation. Like, they didn't want to escape before, or they didn't know how bad it was at least, but now they all just go along with the escape with no prompting whatsoever. Not, not even very little prompting, like, we need to get out of here or anything like that. Just no prompting. They, they wake up and some people are going, let's go, and okay, and they, they just go. Uh, and then Alina straight up says that they can't care for infants out in the wasteland. They're like, we don't, we don't have food, we don't have oxygen for them. So it would make sense to, like, leave them for now and then come back later. Like... If you've ever seen The Promised Neverland, which is a, at least the first season is pretty good, uh, there is a similar situation where characters realize, like, okay, we need to get out of here, but we can't carry the little, little kids with us, so we're just gonna have to leave them here and then come back later, and then they entrust one of the other kids, like, hey, if we don't come back, then you're gonna have to be responsible for getting them out. Like, you know, it. this scene could have hit a lot harder, is what I'm saying. Like, they could have said okay, well, we better succeed out there and survive, not just for our own sakes, but so we can come back and save the babies. But they bring the babies along, and then nothing bad happens, and they, they plan to go to the pod and warn the Ministry about sabotage to prevent all the people in the pod from dying, because I guess they're just, they're on the Ministry's side now, that's the thing. And that is it. That is the whole escape subplot. There are no elaborate plans, there's no real difficulties that they run into, they just wake up in the night, say, let's go, and bring a bunch of people away, and they, they escape. That's it. So now for the plan to overthrow the pod government. Ronan hides about 50 rebels in the attic of his apartment. 50. I would point out that that's ridiculous, but if you need me to tell you that that's ridiculous, you are already a lost cause. Now, some of the rebels here are just soldiers from the pod who've decided that they want to fight against the Ministry. Some of them are rebels who have fought before. Like, I guess they were at the Battle of the Grove and escaped. I, I'm not totally sure because it's not really expanded on, but they are experienced rebels, let's say. And some are some just new citizens from out in the pod who they start training. Like, he can house these people in his house, and they can train in an abandoned gym without anyone noticing. Like okay like it's mentioned that now the ministry is starting to cut off air to empty apartments to prevent you know squatters and other people from hiding in empty apartments and i feel like that should be the default you know you know again like oxygen is a precious resource so why are they pumping into empty apartments that no one lives in 
okay, that's, that's just a thing, okay, we have to learn to live with it. So then Ronan's sister, Neom Knavery, figures out something is wrong because he has a picture of B on his pad, like it's essentially his phone, like he just has a picture of her on there, and she's like, hey, that girl's a terrorist. I know something is up now, and that, that, that's what tips her off. That's like trying to hide the fact that you're in Al-Qaeda, but then you wear a shirt that says, I heart Osama bin Laden. It's just stupid. Uh, so then right after that, Neom Knavery rats them out, and soldiers come to the attic and arrest them all. And then they meet the new pod minister, who was never even mentioned before this point. He's the new pod minister, whose name is Lance Vine. <laughs> What the fuck are these names? Lance Vine sounds like the name of a grass-type gym leader in Pokemon. And his only personality trait is that he's evil. That is it. That is literally it. He's evil. That's all you need to know about him. Vine rubs his hands together as though he's about to be served a large meal. This is getting better and better, he says. This dude is a literal cartoon character. It is impossible to take him seriously on any level. You should have just stuck with Kane Knavery. I know I said that already, but you should have just stuck with him, because at least we got the chance to know him a little bit, and Ronan fighting against his dad might have been cool, you could have done something with that. But this guy, he's introduced 75% of the way through the last book, he does very, very little, and then he dies unceremoniously 17 pages later. I swear to God, I'm not making that up. 17 pages after he comes into the attic and arrests all the rebels, he dies. That is not, that's not even nothing. But Ronan manages to not be arrested, and he gathers his remaining fighters, and he says, hey, we'll fight the Ministry and the Sequoian rebels at the same time. And Max brings his army in, and they attack, and they manage to damage air tubing, and the air to the less important areas gets shut down first. So, like, the poor areas, they stop getting oxygen first, and the prison also stops getting oxygen, because that's not considered essential. And that is where B is being interrogated in her cell by Lance Vine. <laughs> and because the cell is airtight, and no one opens it for some reason, like, the, the minister is just there by himself. He doesn't have any security or anything, there's nobody outside the door in case of an emergency, they just put him in a cell with this terrorist and expect things to be fine. Uh, and because the air is shut off and he's not used to having such thin air, he suffocates very quickly and dies. And then B is okay because she's trained herself to use less oxygen. And I'll admit, even though the science behind it is total nonsense, this is still kind of a cool moment for B. You know, like, she's literally strapped to a chair and she's able to survive while the villain dies. Like, that, that's kind of cool. Like, she, she's the one good POV in this series. And then the final battle really begins. Uh, it's mentioned that there are multiple regiments guarding the air recycling machines. Like, multiple regiments of soldiers. Like, okay, the exact number of soldiers in a regiment does vary depending on the country, but one regiment is at least 600 soldiers. So just in this one area, protecting each individual recycler, there are thousands of soldiers just in this one area. Again, like, how big is the pod? How do they have this many soldiers? And the rebels are, Max's rebels specifically, the ones from Sequoia, are able to overwhelm the armed forces. So, how many rebels are there? None of this makes sense. It's like, again, you just wanted to have a big battle, but you didn't do anything to justify it. Max's soldiers appear, and they attack. How does Max have hundreds of armed soldiers? I'm not sure. Like, again, Sequoia seemed like there would be maybe two or three hundred people there at most, and a lot of them would be non-combatants, but okay, whatever. And how did they get there so quickly? I don't know. How did they get there undetected? I don't know, but they, they, they got there. And actually, I was thinking for a minute, like, if most people in the pod can't exercise because air is expensive, then they're probably in really bad shape. Like, they can't run that well. Whereas all the rebels and everybody who's used to the thin air outside coming in and getting the 30% oxygen of the pod, they're probably going to feel like Superman. You know, it's, like, it's like, like I was saying earlier, going to a high elevation and then going to sea level, and suddenly you're just in much better shape. Now, the Sequoian rebels and 
the rebels, the good guy rebels that Ronan has, uh, it, they, all three sides are very mixed up in this final battle. It's hard to tell who's doing what. But the rebels are charging entrenched positions where the ministry soldiers are, and the ministry soldiers are firing on them with automatic weapons, but the rebels manage to reach the ministry soldiers and beat them. And you might wonder how they do that. Well, it's because they have shields, and those shields are made from car doors. And car doors are not bulletproof, dude. Like, this, this would annoy me a little bit less. I'd be thinking, like, okay, that's not how it works, but whatever. It, it's not real life. I'll, I'll accept it. But it annoys me more because later on, Alina mentions that they aren't bulletproof, and the rebels are getting slaughtered. Like, was this edited at all? Like, one minute, the car doors are bulletproof, the next they're not. Editors, do your job. Now, I do like this final battle, though, because unlike before, the battle at the Grove, the Ministry doesn't have much of an equipment advantage. Like, they can't use tanks or helicopters in the pod, because they'll destroy everything, so the playing field is a bit more even. Like, it does make at least some sense that the Rebels would be able to, to win in this case. So, yeah, I, I kind of liked that. And then uh, the air gets cut off to zone 3, which is the poor zone, and the auxiliaries launch an uprising again, and they attack a bunch of the soldiers along with all the rebels. Now, I, I realized at this point that I kind of wish that there had been at least one POV character who lived among normal people in the pod for a while in the second book, because remember, they already had that huge riot at the end of the first book because they realized, oh, okay, our government is lying to us, and... They're overfeeding us air, they're specifically making it so we can't go outside even though we could possibly start a life out there. And they get really mad, but then that uprising gets forcibly put down, and it's like, well, it'd be kind of neat to see how people live in the aftermath of that. So the pod's going into complete chaos, Quinn finds his mom and his siblings and gets them out of Dodge, but his mom starts going into labor as they're escaping. Did I mention that his mom was pregnant? No but the books didn't mention it until this moment either, so that, yeah, apparently she was very heavily pregnant. And then she gives birth and everything is fine. So the rebels also attack the prison and free everybody there, including B. and then she runs off to find her friends, and while she's running through the streets, she steals an air tank from two kids. <laughs> like, just, that's a dick move, but that's, that's what she does. She is, There's two kids fighting over an air tank, she steals it and runs off. And then she goes to Quinn, and she's like, Hey, uh, let's get the fuck out of here. And they decide to get the fuck out of there. Ronan, meanwhile, is still fighting. Who is he fighting? The enemy. Like, I'm, I'm unsure from page to page whether he's fighting the Ministry or the Sequoian Rebels. Like, that, that is the problem with multi-sided battles. Like, you have to make it clear in the pros who's who. But after a little bit, it's just fully about fighting Max and his crew. So, there, there you go. That, that's just, he's, they're just the villains now, the villains fully switch. And then Alina manages to come face to face with Max. And he does that thing where, the, like, the heroes have the gun on, trained on the villain, and the villain's like, you'll never kill me, you don't have it in you, you don't have the guts. And so for a minute I was sitting there thinking, like, okay, they're gonna have to find some other way to defeat him or something. But no, actually, Alina just shoots him. Like, no hesitation at all. And... That actually does make sense, because she's a bit more used to killing people now. And it did catch me off guard, so I was like, oh, uh, okay, they just... They, they took out the villain when they had the chance. Good on you, heroes. That said, Max goes out like a little bitch. You know, it was way too easy to kill him. In the same way it was way too easy to kill Lance Vine and Kane Knavery. Like, Max has a little bit of personality, sure. Like, it's really just being a creepy cult leader, but he has a little bit there. But he never really came across as a threat, and he doesn't have much presence in any of the scenes he's in. So, I guess he's the best villain of the main three in the series, but he's still not great, or even good, for that matter. And something about the fact that the bad guys at the end are not the evil government, but a different group of rebels, some, something about that just annoys me, because... If you want to do a story about how sometimes revolutions get too bloodthirsty because living in such awful conditions robs you of your humanity, then just commit to it. You know, do a story about that. Like, 
you can't just introduce a new character who is on ostensibly on the side of the rebels and then make them evil. Like you have to show somebody we know falling into that trap because they're just so consumed by hate that they lose sight of what they were fighting for. And honestly, I think the best way to do that would have had to be making Alina a bad guy at the end here. Not necessarily the main villain, but one of the villains. You know, because she has motive for wanting to kill everyone in the pot. She should have been on the side of Max and the others. Uh, like, her parents were killed before the story even began. Like, I, I didn't mention that earlier because it's not that important, but it, it is there. Like, in the backstory, her parents were killed. And her boyfriend was killed later, or at least she thought he was. He comes back for no reason. And she was at the Battle of the Grove, where she is nearly killed by Ministry soldiers. And we know Alina pretty well. Like, it would be much more powerful to see somebody that we previously viewed as being heroic fall. You know, and fall into that trap and start saying, it's okay to murder a bunch of innocent people in the pursuit of my goal. Like, that would be more powerful. Or maybe she, she was just like that the entire time and we didn't realize it until much later. Either way, you wouldn't need to change that much of the story to make it happen, and it would give you a much, much more compelling villain. So despite the leader of both the evil Ministry forces and the evil Sequoian forces both being dead, the battle just keeps going for a bit. Like, the Sequoians set a bunch of bombs to destroy the pod. I thought they were just gonna destroy the air recyclers, not destroy the whole thing, but whatever. Uh, and then Alina is like, oh, I can't disable the bomb, so she just grabs it and runs off with it. And then it, once she's far away from the pod, it goes off and it kills her, but she saves everybody. And then suddenly after that, the Ministry and the good rebels have the Sequoians at gunpoint, like they lost. Again, I don't know why they were trying to destroy the pod altogether, because they had already destroyed most of the air recyclers, so it, it leaves them in a situation where they are unable to threaten Sequoia. Like, even if they find out where they are and decide they want to attack, they'd be unable to because so many people would be dead and they'd be too focused on rebuilding. And with the Ministry gone, maybe they'd be able to set up a friendly government so that the Sequoians would have an ally over there instead of just a bunch of pissed off people who want nothing more than them all to die. Like, Max's soldiers have the intelligence of a mentally disabled moth, I swear. Oh, by the way, Max's second in command, who I assume is commanding all the soldiers after his death, is a woman named Vanya. And we see her earlier, but we do not see her at all during the climax. And we never find out her fate. Like, we never find out what happens to her after the battle. She's just, she's, she was there, now she's gone. And uh, also, during the fighting, Quinn's dad is wounded. And Quinn finds him, and he tries saving him. He's like, hold on, Dad, we'll get you a medic. And it, it doesn't work. Like, he, he isn't able to save him. Uh, but they do make up right before his dad dies. And it's, it's actually an okay scene. You know, it's not amazing because I wasn't really attached to either of these characters. Like, they just, they have no personality between them. But seeing him go, hey, I'm proud of you, son. Like, it's, it, it still got me a little bit. And then we go to the epilogue, which is from B's perspective. Uh, they are building a new town outside the pod, and her and Quinn are officially together now. Yeah, if, if you forgot there was supposed to be a romance there, I don't blame you. Like, she was just in love with him, and he didn't seem to reciprocate much, and just in the epilogue that they're just in love and they're together now. And there are other people who are starting to come out of the pod, like they're getting used to the thin air, they're training themselves to get used to it. So... The, the world is saved, you know? All the bad guys are dead, the Ministry's power is broken, a lot of good people died in the process, but they did succeed, and now it's time to rebuild a better world. Like, it's... It's a good ending, to be honest. Like, they got, it's a happy ending, sure, but the characters did have to suffer and work at least somewhat to do it, and they did lose friends along the way. Like, Alina died, and Quinn's dad died, and bunch of rebels and ministry soldiers and just regular people died as well. So that was Breathe, and like I said, it's it's, it's not that bad. You know, like, it, it is bad, it's stupid, it's silly, but there's nothing to get angry about here, you know? the There are words, these words are mostly correct, and these mostly correct words are in the mostly correct order. Like, it's, it could be worse. Like, it's following a trend, obviously, of, you know, young adult 
dystopian novels, which were huge, like, 12 years ago. And it, it was always about overthrowing an evil government. And even if it's following that trend, that trend does at least give it the skeleton of a good story. You know, it gives you something to work with, at the very least. But the problem here is that there's nothing besides that skeleton. You know, there's no meat or organs there. Like, this video might have seemed like it went by fairly quick, but that's just because there's little substance here. Like, there, there's barely anything other than the contrived twists and point A, point B. Like, characters are living under evil government, they run away from evil government, they fight evil government, fight evil government some more, fight evil government along with evil rebels, and then the day is saved. Like, there's just nothing else there to talk about, character-wise or story-wise. Like, most of the story is just things happening, and I am vaguely aware that I'm supposed to care about it, but I just don't, you know? Like, it, it's like having sex with a ghost. I can't feel anything, but I'm aware that I should be feeling things. The worst parts of this book series are honestly just the junk science and the fact that the characters are really dull. Well, that and the fact that the story is really disjointed and doesn't really have clear villains. You know? Like, th those are the worst things here. Like, the world is ridiculous, but the message almost works. You know, forcing people to pay for air, something that they need, and that they have no choice but to pay you for it, that's just extortion. And that, that is the message here, but it's not focused on enough, so it doesn't quite work. You know, like, 1984 is also a ridiculous dystopian book. Like, the world that 1984 takes place in is pretty over the top when you stop to think about it, but it does get the point across, so people are fine with it. And Breathe doesn't focus on the point enough, so it doesn't really get the point across, and so it doesn't quite work, you know? Like, they should have had a lot more time showing us how life is for auxiliaries. And the final villains of this story really just shouldn't have been rebels, because honestly, the final villains being rebels makes it seem like the Ministry is almost correct. You know, it feels like they're saying, I'm the only thing standing between you and Chaos, and, like, they were almost correct. Like, if it weren't for the fact that uh, people are able to adjust to having less oxygen in the environment, then the Ministry would have been correct. Like, all the rebels would have been crazy terrorists who were going to get everybody killed. Like, the simplistic messaging here really just needed to have a simplistic story. Because it's not bad for a story to be simplistic. It is bad for a story to be unfocused, and Breathe very much is unfocused. Because first it's about running from the Ministry, for, at least for Alina, it's about running from the Ministry, and then the others join up despite having literally no reason to join up. Then it is about finding the Grove, then it's about fighting the Ministry. Then it's about finding Sequoia several times, because remember, we have several different characters or groups of characters who are all trying to find it, and they find it at different times, so we have to watch them find Sequoia more than once. Then it's about escaping a cult, then it's about fighting the Ministry and Sequoians at the same time, except they're only sort of fighting the Ministry, and the Ministry are almost the good guys at the end, but also they were still evil for trapping people in the pod and forcing them to pay for air. Like, none of these ideas are necessarily bad, but they, none of them flow very well, and they especially don't lead into each other very well. There are three main antagonists, one of whom gets no screen time, and two of whom get almost no screen time. And all of them have no personality beyond being evil and having names that sound like they were chosen by 20-year-old Mormon parents. Like, Kane Knavery has a drinking problem, that's, that's something, but it never goes anywhere. And Max is kind of a creepy rapist, but that's not really focused on enough to really even make us hate him that much. Like, obviously I didn't like the guy, but if, if you want us to really hate him for being a creepy rapist, you, you have to have him do something or almost do something pretty bad. Not necessarily sexually assault somebody, but, you know, something. And then I guess the final villain is Vanya, who was Max's second-in-command, who was still leading the army at the very end of the battle. Like, I... I don't know. Like, I guess... I guess that's how it works. I guess she was the final villain. And even the uncomfortable sexual assault stuff is barely there, so I can't get mad at it. You know, I'm just annoyed. And even then, not very annoyed. Just slightly annoyed. Like, that's it. The series isn't that bad. It is almost competent at times. It's just an adventure story about overthrowing an evil government. We're driving in the right direction, 
but the air conditioning in this car is broken and everybody else wants to listen to bluegrass music. You know, like it, it's not a total failure, but it's not pleasant. There are worse books out there that I have read, but there are also worse books out there that are much more entertaining and much more fun to go through than this series, because if this book series had had even one or two truly bizarre things, which, like, you had opportunities to throw some weird shit in there, and if there had just been one or two really bizarre things, like one or two weird characters, one or two really bizarre events or something, it would stick out a little bit more in my head. Like, maybe Kane Knavery only became evil because his dad was a serial killer, and he carries the serial killer gene, and he doesn't want to be a serial killer, but he has to, it's just in his genetics, which is... That's an actual plot point in Riverdale, by the way. That, that show is nuts. <laughs> or what if the pod had some sort of state-mandated religion where everybody had to follow it, and they worshipped the last tree? You know, like there'd just be one big one in the middle of the pod, and they'd be like, there's no more out there, this is the last one, and they all worship it, but then it turns out it wasn't the last tree. You know, like, it, go big or go home, is what I'm saying. This book series is only a duology, and I was thinking, maybe if it was a trilogy, it, it, maybe it would have just been the exact same story, but stretched out even more, and so it would be even worse and more boring. Or, forcing the author to fill more time might have forced her to throw in a bunch of weird stuff. Like, I don't know, man. I just, I don't have that much else to say about this. Like, this is just the Lorax, but it's serious and kind of edgy. But, other than that, I don't have anything else to say. And, hopefully that's not the case with my next review. So next up after Breathe, I am going to do a retelling of the myth of Hades and Persephone. No, not that one. No, not that one either. Yeah, that's right, that one. Everneath. This is a paranormal romance aimed at teen girls, and it is based on a story about the original incel. So surely this won't be full of toxicity and stupidity and weird character choices. I'm sure. But anyways, that's all. See you later. Goodbye. Oh, okay. You're you're still uh, you're still watching. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. You know, I could always use more watch time. Uh, you see all these names here? These are my patrons. These are people that send me money once a month over on Patreon. If you want to get your name here and also get early access to videos and stuff, then consider consider donating, please. Uh, my ten dollar and up patrons are Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Chibs Ahoy, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dio, Echo. Flax, James M, Karkat Kitsune, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Microphone, Mistboy, Peep the Toad, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, Ve Victus, and Wesley. You're all great. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, that's all. Goodbye.